Hello everyone, I'm Jensen. Today is Tuesday, February 9th. And from another coronavirus update from Ohio Governor Mike DeWine to day one of the Senate impeachment trial for former President Donald Trump, I have all the stories you need to know to get in the loop tonight. But first, we are experiencing some serious cold right now. Is there more of this ahead? Well, I will pass it off to our first alert weather team. Hour by hour forecast here. Fairly quiet though, the next 24 to 36 hours. We got some sunshine out there today. Again, if you're south of the Maumee River, I think we'll clear out a little bit for this afternoon, but you might hang on to clouds a little bit more down there. Through this evening, not much in the far as snowfall is expected tonight. Could get a little bit of patchy fog out there. That's the type that sticks to the trees. And so tomorrow morning when the sun comes out, could be one of those days that all the trees look kind of coated in frost. A really cool view for us. 8 a.m. There you see it clearer skies. Any fog burns off. Clouds build in late in the day. And overnight Wednesday into Thursday could get some light snowfall. And you'll see that right here on our extended forecast. Light chances of snow Wednesday into Thursday. Friday, a little bit of a quiet day, but some light snow chances here. And then Saturday into Sunday, I'm highlighting this as one to kind of watch for us. 20 degrees for a high temperature here, but this is the scenario. Area of low pressure is going to try to sneak through the Ohio River Valley. Might have a just enough moisture to wrap around some snow on the backside. And so if you're wondering, next time you're really going to need the shovel or the snowblower, potentially just keep an eye out for this weekend. Nothing guaranteed at this point, but I just want to watch that one closely. Could wake up Valentine's Day with a fresh layer and coating of snow on the ground. And the man accused of shooting three children, killing two on Friday, is reported to have a long criminal history in the state of Florida. Kevin Moore is suspected of shooting and killing five-year-old Amir and one-year-old Gabriel Phillips and critically injuring their four-year-old brother Ashton at the Burnport apartment complex. Now we know that in two separate incidents in Florida, Moore pleaded guilty to charges of domestic violence and resisting police officers. In November of 2014, Moore was arrested by the Hillsborough County Sheriff office on battery, domestic violence, false imprisonment, opposing an officer with violence and battery on a law enforcement officer. Moore eventually pleaded guilty to those four charges and was credited with time served in jail. Then in August of 2016, Moore was arrested once again on domestic battery charges and violently resisting an officer, this time by the Temple Terrace Police Department. Charges included domestic battery by strangulation, tampering with a witness, and resisting an officer with violence. A police report on that incident says Moore slapped and choked a female victim. Parts of her written statement are redacted because juveniles were mentioned, but it does say in part, Redacted were arguing about a coloring book and he got angry that I didn't reprimand the redacted, so he slapped me. The statement goes on to say Moore prevented her from calling 911 and he put his arm up against her neck. She was able to get away from the situation, though, with her kids. Moore pleaded guilty on these charges and was again given credit for time served. He was ordered to have no contact with this victim. Now, Moore did not have a criminal record in Toledo prior to Friday's alleged murders. He was arraigned yesterday and is being held on a $5 million bond. And today marked day one in the second Senate impeachment trial for former President Donald Trump. On the schedule today was a debate and vote over whether or not a trial would even be constitutional now that Trump is out of office. And ultimately, the Senate found that the trial was constitutional by a vote of 56 to 44. Now, the articles for impeachment this time around revolve around the question of if Trump was personally responsible for the insurrection on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. The prosecution of House impeachment managers showed today video from the riot alongside remarks made by the former president, claiming he was slow to condemn the violence of the mob and that his speech to rioters prior to the assault only encouraged the attacks. But Trump's legal team argues that he was using his First Amendment rights when speaking about the election and say that there's no evidence that Trump knew rioters would storm the Capitol when he made his speech. So let's break things down quickly. Again, today was day one where the Senate debated over the trial's constitutionality with a vote this afternoon. Tomorrow, things pick up at noon and arguments will begin. Each side has up to 16 hours. Written questions will then be submitted and then there will be another vote on whether or not to allow witnesses or new evidence to be admitted. You can watch tomorrow's proceedings live on WTOL.com and on the WTOL Facebook page. And today we got another coronavirus update from Ohio Governor Mike DeWine with a big focus on schools. DeWine's goal is to get all students back to in-person learning by March 1st. Teachers and school staff were included in phase 1B of the state's vaccination rollout plan for this very reason. In one week, 566 schools in the state have had teachers and staff vaccinated. And at the end of this week, DeWine said that number will jump to 1,300. And schools in the state are shifting with more and more making the return to in-person learning.
we are already really seeing a change. We're seeing a movement from remote learning to being back in the classroom. In December, 45% of Ohio's students were fully remote. And on Tuesday, DeWine said that number had lowered to less than 15%. But why is this important? Well, fall 2020 enrollment and assessment data shows that students are falling a bit behind. Superintendent of Public Instruction, Paulo DeMaria, said that in kindergarten, 8% more students were found to be not on track. For the state's third graders, about 8% less students scored proficient or better. The study also looked at the impact of the different modes of instructional delivery. So in fully remote districts, those third grade proficiency rates decreased even more substantially by about 12% compared to 8% showed by those under a five-day in-person learning model. So what is the state doing to help? Well, each school district in the state has been asked to formulate a specific plan aimed at the individual needs of their students. Parents are also encouraged to reach out to their schools to explain what their kids' needs are and what they think could help. And in the state's executive budget, DeWine said his team will be expanding their investment in student wellness and success programs to $1.1 billion. In addition to school funding, the state is funneling money toward helping those most in need pay for their rent and utilities. His team has requested that the controlling board approve $100 million in federal funding to help low-income Ohioans who do not own their own home pay their rent, water, sewer, wastewater, electric, gas, oil, and trash removal bills. In order to be eligible, households must be at or below 80% of their county's area median income, have experienced a financial hardship due to COVID-19, and demonstrate a risk of experiencing homelessness due to housing instability. If you are eligible, contact your local community action agency for help. For more information, I have a link in the description of this video, so check that out if you need it. And Valentine's Day is this Sunday, but if you're thinking about using an app to find yourself a date, you may want to take it easy. As the pandemic continues, even more singles are shifting to online dating to try and find that spark. But a new study suggests that Ohio is the fourth most dangerous state for online dating. Highspeedinternet.com ranked the safest and most dangerous places to use dating apps like Tinder and Hinge ahead of Valentine's Day using cybercrime data from the FBI and STD statistics from the CDC. The study also says the pandemic has created new opportunities for cyber crime on dating apps, so scammers are now playing into people's emotions in a different way, using COVID-19 sob stories to get matches to send them money. And according to the study, the five safest states for online dating are West Virginia, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Kentucky. Alaska, Nevada, Maryland, and Colorado joined Ohio as the five most dangerous. So yeah, I think I'll just watch the Titanic and call it a night. And before I go, I want to talk about one more very important holiday, and that is National Pizza Day, which is today. So pick up that phone, place an order at your favorite local spot, which is exactly what I have done. And if you've made it this far, first of all, thank you. But I want you to leave a comment letting me know what your favorite type of pizza is. I like Detroit style. If you like Chicago deep dish, that's not pizza, but you didn't hear that from me. But that is all I have for you today. If you like this video, hit that like button and of course subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Jensen and now you are in the loop.